Welcome to Born or Made, the podcast that dives deep into the heart of success and identity. Are the traits that define us as leaders ingrained from birth, or are they carved out throughout our experiences? Join your host, Anne-Marie LaTulip, as we ask these questions to some of the most insightful and inspiring entrepreneurs of our time. Each episode, we explore their journeys, the decisions that shaped them, and how they've molded their own paths to success. So whether you're an aspiring entrepreneur, a seasoned business owner, or simply curious about the interplay between nature and nurture and professional growth, you're in the right place. Get ready for compelling stories, transformative insights, and a new perspective on what it really takes to make it in the world of entrepreneurship. to the Born or Made podcast. I am your host, Anne-Marie LaTulip. And with me today from Colombia, my goodness, yes. I have the lovely Ariana Car- Carmen Rose, which is funny because you're a rose and I'm a, Latula- I'm a tulip. So I love that. I will tell you a little bit about Ari and she builds badass brands for badass business owners, female business owners, mostly correct, Ari? Is that right? Badass. All right. Yes. Awesome. So why don't you tell us a little bit more about you? Because I'm sure people are are curious about what badass brands means. So please tell us. Yes. Um, badass brands came uh, really organically to me. Uh, whenever I would work with a business owner, I'd say like, you're such a badass. Why are you not showcasing it? Um, Because what tends to happen is people are so skilled. They have the most expertise, but they don't know how to showcase it, right? And so I'd always say like, let me showcase the world how badass you are. You're too close to the problem. Let me, this is my superpower. So I would always say like, oh my God, here's your badass brand. And then I started realizing all my clients are badass women. They are like having a podcast, like they do speaking engagements, they're writers, and they have kids and they're traveling, like they're doing all these things. And so badass brands for badass women came about because they're so bold and they have personality and they're willing to like show up and really embody what makes them unique. And so I always say that a badass brand is really memorable and really makes a connection just like how you would most businesses get their business through word of mouth. Mm -hmm. And so I really try and translate you in an in-person to your website. So that's what a badass brand is to me. I I love that so much because the brand is is so important. So when, when women come to you, like you were just describing, yes, do most oftentimes they not really have a clear idea of brand identity? Yes. You start from the, the ground up basically. Yes, I would say the biggest problem I've seen in all of my work, um, I've worked with many, many women, is they have a lack of clarity about what their offer is, what their niche, their niche is, their marketing. They're so good at what they do, but they don't know how to translate that in a really clear way. And clarity breeds trust. So I'm always like, okay, how do we make this super clear to your perfect fit client? Because so often what I notice is that women are so talented, but they're they're not attracting the amount of clients that they want or the type of clients. They're getting people who want to bargain with them or don't see their full expertise. And so what I really try to do is like, how do we get so clear on what makes you such a badass that people are willing to wait to work with you because they won't invest in anyone else because you are the perfect person. So we really deep dive into getting super crystal clear so everybody knows how badass you are. And you really only have 15 seconds in 2024 to make that first impression. That's how long the average website is viewed. And so I have to, I have to be really clear in 15 seconds. And so it's, it's a really fun process and women really like it. So yeah, yeah, well, it's fun. I, 
I think that's great. And I've checked out some of your designs. I will say I, I did a little <laughs> research and, and they're beautiful. They're absolutely yeah. beautiful and on in many different industries. So yeah. um, kudos. I think you're doing what you're doing is fantastic work. Um, so tell me, why are you in Colombia? Do you do you live in Colombia or? Um, so I am originally from Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I moved after college to Austin, Texas and lived there about a decade. Um, I taught special education for six years and obviously I had no money. I was working like three jobs as a teacher. Mm -hmm. I could obviously not travel. And when I decided to go back to school for UX UI design, um, I realized I could work from anywhere and I really just decided to put all my things in storage in July and decided, let's go travel. So I am going um, a new place every month and just kind of, you know, being a digital nomad for a little bit, traveling solo, giving my mom a heart attack, I'm sure. Oh, I love <laughs> that. You know, it's so funny that you say that a digital nomad because mm -hmm. I... You know, I I think that I'm a, a good deal older than you. And had I had that opportunity when I was your age, I oh my God, I would have done the same thing. I think yes. the digital landscape is so, uh, gives us so much opportunity now. It, it's fantastic. But I, I want to go back to something that you said. So you were a special education teacher, which by the yes. way is fantastic. I have a brother with special needs, so I, mm -hmm. I commend that. What... um. What led to that transition? Because that seems like it would be something that would have led to a lifelong career, right? So yeah. how, what was it that made you decide, okay, wait a second, I want to do UX UI. And by the way, for anyone listening that doesn't know what UX UI means, it's um, designing user interfaces, user experience, things like that in terms of a website or software. Um, so talk about that a little bit. Tell us more about what prompted that transition. That's a great question. I get that question quite often. Um, I've always been a designer. Um, even when I was young, I was always trying to redo the grocery store in a way I felt made sense. Right. <laughs> and then when I went to college, um, I have a religious studies degree and a psychology degree and decided to volunteer with refugees and their kids had kids with special needs. And obviously they don't, they don't speak English, they're from another country. And I really became passionate about advocating for these kids. And I naturally fell into special education and I loved it. It was, it was amazing because I'm super empathetic, I'm super creative and I love kids. And so I didn't understand I was doing user experience as a teacher. I would take these kids with severe, severe disabilities and I would design everything custom for them. And I kept winning award after an award. And it was because I approached it as, well, this kid learns this way. So I need to design his day this way. And with special education, you're really designing for the child. And I loved it. But during COVID, I realized I had empathy fatigue. Most of my kids came from trauma and really difficult situations, and I realized it wasn't sustainable for me. And so I, I take classes, I'm really nerdy, and I read a lot. And so I just stumbled on a UX UI design course for free, and it took all of my skills, empathy, design, psychology, and made it into a little bit more... I, I could step away a little bit more from giving so much and mm. protect more of my energy. And so I loved it and I, I truly do miss my students, but I think being a special ed teacher has allowed me to design websites and apps with a very unique perspective. All my business owners are so unique and all users are different. I design for visual learners, auditory learners, people with ADHD. And so I think that has allowed me to be so successful in the sense of I'm not just designing your website, I'm designing your business and it needs to be profitable. And so I think the way I think is in terms of how does everybody understand your content? Because it makes sense to you because you're the expert, but how do I explain it with somebody with three disabilities 
How do I design it with somebody who's totally not in your industry, but could benefit? And so I think that makes me an excellent designer in the sense of I'm really making your business accessible to your perfect fit client. So I love it, but that's kind of how I transitioned. No, I I love that. And I can tell you're super passionate about it too. (laughs) And yeah, yeah, again, like I said earlier, uh, creating that, that branding so that you can identify or others can identify with you is so important um, in what we do. And I say what we do, because for anyone listening, you all know that I build uh, funnels and backend automation systems, which, you know, have to match the front facing brand. So we have very complementary skills or talents, I would say, but I come from a, I'm a very creative person too. And I want to ask you, do you have any performance history? Were you ever creative in terms of, you know, performing, (laughs) dancing, singing, anything like that? No, um, never sheltered. So my parents were like, you just study. Um, Uh, yeah, we, we didn't have money. So it was just, you need to get a scholarship. You need to be very book smart. Um, but I think for me, uh, I was always designing things in my head. I have a very big imagination. Mm -hmm. And so I take regular time to daydream, to hike, to walk. So (laughs) I say my, my design process has always been very in my head for sure. I love that you take time to daydream. (laughs) Oh, daydreaming is form of planning. I've, I've daydreamed so many things and now I live those dreams out. Yes. That is so funny because, you know, I used to do that too. Like (laughs) not, I know this is about you, not me, but it's so funny because my favorite times to daydream, which is funny, but people are going to, if they hear this, they're going to be like, what are you talking about? But it's when I'm driving. Oh, for sure. Yeah. When I'm driving or right before I go to sleep, which would kind of be night dreaming but but yeah so I think that's 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 really funny and awesome so tell me you you touched on when you were young a little bit and the premise of this show is called born or made are we born with an entrepreneurial mindset or does it evolve and so for you as when you were younger did you ever have any aspirations of owning your own business or being an entrepreneur or was it always to to be a teacher or how did how did that look when you were young um, when I was young, I played teacher a lot. I, my sister was <laughs> a student. She hated it. Um, no, I didn't envision being a business owner until much, much later, but, um, I've done a lot of reflecting on it and I grew up in a very abusive household and, um, I think I always dreamed of more, right? Like, I think that's why I lived in my head so much is because what was happening at home was very traumatic and scary. And I would always tell my mom, please leave, please leave. And she would always say, we don't have enough. We won't be able to pay our bill, our bills. And so I, I repeated those terrible behaviors, dating terrible men when I was Mm. older. So many women can relate and we stay too long because in the job or the relationship, because we fear not having enough. And it's like that safety, right? I think for me, I realized that I needed to control my own money, right? Because if I could learn to to have my to control my own money, I controlled my life. I didn't have to stay in these terrible relationships or terrible jobs anymore. And um, and so for me, I think entrepreneurship was my like independence as a woman mm-hmm. to be like I, I could I know how to fish now. I know how to make money. So no man can ever take away my website or my brand or the skills I've built. This is something that I embody naturally. And so I think that's why women relate to me so much is because I really believe. In women's empowerment, women should thrive. We run business differently. And so I think it comes from, I think the seed was planted when I was young. And I think that's why I'm so passionate about working with women now is feeling so trapped and small and controlled when I was younger and realizing when women have entrepreneurial skills and a business that like allows them to live their values. 
values and really thrive. They have so much freedom. So I think I think I was probably made into an entrepreneur to answer your question, but I think I was in perfect conditions to like, no, I will not be in this situation. I will do my own thing. I will break free. Yeah. And that's, thank God that you did that though. Um, at, at such a young age too, because a lot of women I know, uh, you know, like you said, stay way too long. Not that it's ever too late, right? No, I don't want to ever get that message out, but just sort of endure yeah. that uh, a little longer than than they needed to. So that's yeah. so tell me going back to the transition we talked about from special ed to running your own business. What was that in terms of the journey? What was that like? How did it start? So you took the course. Yes. You loved it and you said, "Okay, I'm I'm going to start my own company." And you started getting clients. Was that as easy as it was or was there a, oh. a journey there? <laughs> I, I signed up for a boot camp. I did the boot camp for a year and quickly got an ed tech job. So I worked at an ed tech company building their app and their website. And I believed in the mission, but um, me being a special ed teacher, I love my students and I'm making this tangible difference. I'm taking this kid from Honduras who's never you know, read at all and teaching him how to read in fifth grade, it's such a fulfilling thing. And then to go to a tech company where my whole day is spent on Slack, talking to a software developer about why this button needs to have different language and a different style for usability, it wasn't, it wasn't hitting my core needs. Like I didn't feel like I was making a difference. And so I was really depressed that first year. And one of my friends came to me and said, you keep talking to me about how my website sucks. Why don't you just redo it? And I was like, okay. And I redid it and it won like an award. And he uh, he was like, I've never had so many classes sell out. I've never had my retreats sell out. And so he offered me other businesses that he ran. And then other people started coming to me. And I didn't, I didn't take it as a business idea at all. Um, at all. I just was doing it on the side, helping friends. Somebody knew Eric Armstead on the 49ers and I helped him. And then I was like, I think I should do this. Um, <laughs> but I, did, I wasn't ready to take the leap, but I, I was in an abusive relationship and he was trying to trap me with, with staying in the company. Right. So I was like, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to do this on my own and fly with no plan. I was like, I know I'm good at this. I have degrees in this. I've had side projects. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to try it for one year and burn my ships and put everything into this. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But I want to be really bold for a year. And then it worked. And I was like, oh, okay, I can do it. So that's what I did. Oh, that's awesome. That is yeah. awesome. Now, do you have anybody working for you or are you just by yourself or? Just myself right now. I would love to hire um, a VA one day, but I try really hard to only work with women. So I have a woman bookkeeper and a woman CPA and I'm really about like women's empowerment. Um, but no, I, I want to keep my business small. I really like being with the client. I really enjoy getting to know them. Mm -hmm. I don't want anyone else to take on the design role. I think I would hire back-end people one day, yep. and, but I'm just not there yet. I really enjoy working with a business owner and solving problems together. So I think that's the best part of my job. So it's fun. Yeah. Building that relationship. Now, do you do any ongoing maintenance for them? Um, you and I were talking before we hit record, yeah. but for people listening who are curious, is it yeah. just once the website is done, that's it or? Yes. Um, so I believe that the faster you have a badass website, the faster you make money. And honestly, I don't understand why websites need to take so long, especially if you're efficient and you know what you're doing. I do a lot of prep work before, but we start on a Monday. I, I already interviewed you. I have all that I need. And we start on a Monday. We usually end on a Friday. We have a launch party. And I'm like fly baby bird, but I check in once a month and I'm like, hey, how can I help you? Can I connect you with an email marketer? Can I help you with anything? Mm -hmm. They need, my clients typically experience a lot of growth and they'll come and hire me again 
when they want to expand their brand or refine it or add to their website. Maybe they need a pitch deck for a speech or some flyers for opportunities that they're attracting. But I don't like to charge monthly management fees because I feel it's kind of a waste of money for a business owner. I think come to me when you are fully ready for that. It's it's use your money on other things that are going to make you successful. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really like a one one time thing. I check in on you. If you have questions, people ask me questions all the time. My clients text me and I'm happy to support them. Um, but usually I'm pointing them in a direction where they already trust me so much that I'm like the perfect person to do your social media is this person or mm -hmm. whatever. So I'm really more of the consultant at that point. Um, but I always check in because your brand does grow. Your website is a living, breathing business asset. So it will change over time. But I just don't think you should pay me monthly to do tiny edits. Like, I just don't think you should pay for me for that. That's that's fantastic. And a lot of people do. <laughs> so so and that's... I'm like, yeah, yeah, no, I 100% I agree. In fact, I had somebody that was telling me that I should do that for the funnel designs. And it's like, it takes me two seconds to edit, you know, this little. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So I, I, I hear you. I feel the same way about that. So tell yeah. me about one of the, one of the best, or I guess most, what's the word I want to use here? Maybe a, a design that you're the most proud of? Like, can you tell us about a project that was the most either challenging or fun, but yet you're the most proud of? Ooh, those are two. I would, I'd say two. Um, okay. I would say one of them is a realtor named Jen Baker. I met her at uh, a retreat. We were learning about neuro-linguistic programming. We were learning about the science of language, which I'm really interested in, especially as a copywriter, and the magnetism behind certain words. And we were rooming together at this retreat. We did not talk business at all. We were crying. We were laughing. We were sharing our deepest, darkest secrets. And we're Ubering back to the, air, the airport. And she asked me, hey, can I see your work? I don't know what you do. Like, let me see. And she was like, how do I work with you? And I was like, oh, just book a call. It was so fun working with her because we had already connected on such a deep level that building her brand, I felt like she just really trusted me. And she was so nervous. She was going through menopause and she was really nervous to get her brand photos. But she was like, I trust whoever you hire is going to take really good care of me. And sure enough, the brand photographer I built a relationship with gave her champagne, made her a playlist, like really had like a dance party with her to like loosen her up. I just felt like we had the most fun building her brand because she and I built this deep relationship, right? It wasn't mm -hmm. even like a working relationship. It was more of a friendship and so now I'm going to be on her podcast. She's invited me to speak at her events. I've met some of her friends. So now we're now we're we're really cool. I went to go see her a week ago in oh, Austin. Oh, fun! So that oh, would that's be awesome. Yeah. And then my second one would be I've had two dominatrix clients, and I really enjoyed those product projects because they were really terrified of of getting a website built and. They were like, are you okay with this? And I was like, yes. Why wouldn't I be? Like, I'm not going to judge you or you, you should feel no shame. Like, this is your work and this is something you're proud of. Like, I'm a safe space. And so now I get a lot of referrals for the, from those women because I made them feel really comfortable and they love their brand. And so I think working with two women who get they told me they they went to many people and they they got turned down or got disrespected they were like I'm not going to build you a website really yes and so I treated them like everybody else and I think that they they felt really seen because I was like oh no this is your business you have no shame about it why would I put that on you 
Um, and I'm, I just, I really enjoyed working with those women and I feel very honored that they, they've now referred me to so many people. Wow. That is so interesting. I want to, can we talk about that for a minute? Because I yeah. did see that on your, yeah. on your list of designs. I'm like, wow, <laughs> that is so cool. Like I'm not saying to each their own, I'm not judging, yeah. but I wouldn't have thought that somebody in that profession, dominatrix would have a website. I didn't like, I was so shocked to see that. Yeah. And now you're saying that there are many, mm -hmm. uh, quite a few, right? Yeah. That is so interesting to me. Yeah. No, I mean, I think it's maybe a world that most people might not think about or be involved in. But when we were doing the brand clarity interview and talking about their business, their values, what they've tried, what they what's not working, what is working, some of their goals, they're just like any other business owner. And it was fascinating to hear about how educated they were, how well-traveled they were, how they have like dreams and goals. And I, I loved every minute of it. I learned so much about the culture of being a dominatrix. They told me about a woman should be treated as a queen, that they should be in receiving mode and that they are typically gifted like a tribute. So for example, if they like certain types of gifts or something, that people will offer it to them. And it's a very spiritual thing. And so I just felt like I was learning through the whole process. And it was it was fascinating. And so yeah, dominatrixes have websites, dominatrixes have landing pages. Um, and it's really fascinating. And I honestly would be honored to do any, I, I've gotten asked to do um, like sex toy workshop or websites and yeah, things like that. I so saw uh, another one, a sexual intimacy. Uh, was that like a coach or... She was a dominatrix who trained the other one. She worked as a dominatrix for like 10 years or 12 years in New York, but she's pivoted. She does a lot of like work with women, you know, yoni massage, women in their power. She is a shibari coach. So shibari is like the, the art of Japanese rope tying for intimacy. And so she's created a whole different course. She has so many offerings besides she doesn't dominatrix anymore she's expanded past that and she she does a million other things she like skydives she like does retreats around the world for women um so yeah she she's pivoted and i i think she's fascinating she's so yeah, fun you, to talk to you were part of that journey that's so cool yeah. that is so cool to get to uh, learn, like you said, and experience other industries because yeah. your, your range of industries goes from, like you said, dominatrix to even sports, yeah. right? You do uh, some sports pages as well. Yeah. I've worked with, um, some elite runners. Um, I've worked with a soccer player, um, Eric Armstead. Um, he's a football player on the 49ers, a baseball player, a baseball agency. Um, yeah, I mean, it's really about listening to your client and figuring out what's working for them, what's not. Every website is not the same. And I like that problem solving. So it's really about like creating that custom business for them, just like how I would with a kid with special needs. Mm -hmm. Everybody has a unique path. I can't, cookie cutter doesn't work in 2024. The market is so oversaturated that I really have to be very creative. And I think that's what I like about my job so much. And I think that's why people like me is like, I'm not using templates. I'm really like, but how, how, how can we fix this problem in your business? Because I'm not making a pretty website with fonts. I don't believe in that. Your website should be functional and you should be able to edit your own site. You should be empowered to make these changes your own I, I really just believe like you should be, you can work with me, but then go and hire somebody else for ongoing things. Like I'm just a part of your journey. I, I may work with you at a certain phase and then you'll come back to me at like phase five and that's okay. Yep. 
Yeah. And I'm glad you touched on that too, because there are so many, uh, I don't want to say softwares, platforms, whatever you want to call them that, that do yeah. AI, AI templates, yeah. um, things like that, that are exactly the same just input business name here and um i'm so against that too but it makes it challenging for i think for the work that we do uh because what we do is more valuable and and um, people a lot of people don't understand that when they can get something for very cheap um mm -hmm. what makes you know something custom and, and specifically designed so much more valuable yeah, I get a lot of pushback from that. Did do you as well? I, for a funnel page, it might be a little different because, you know, there are landing page builders that are AI. How do you experience that with websites as well? Yes, all the time. Um, um, yeah. Honestly, I have a part on my website that says, I hate how easy it is to create a website mm. um, because I went to school for this and I've practiced in the industry. I know what I'm doing. I have quite a large portfolio. I only showcase like six, but I have like 30 plus brands on there um, that I've worked with. And it really makes me mad that almost anyone can design a website and, or they'll do it themselves or their sister will do it. Mm. And it's, that's just because you have a website, it's probably working against you because what I've realized is that just because you have a logo and some colors and you post on social media or you're marketing and doing your newsletters, it all drives traffic to this website. And your website is your fundamental business home. And if it sucks, right, then you're like, oh, but I have it. It's fine. It's like crossed off the list. But yeah. website should be attracting like three to five perfect fit clients a week. It should be getting you a ton of compliments. It should really be your stand-in when you're not networking or in person. It should be you whenever you're sleeping. And I think so many people think, well, if I can do it, you're not worth it. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, well, what's your biggest problem in your business? Well, I need more clients. Well, I know why you're not getting clients. It's because I don't understand your website. And if I don't understand it, what makes you think anyone else is understanding it? So yes, I totally, I totally hate that they think branding and websites are fluffy, but truly and honestly, there's so much psychology behind a really good website, a really good brand copy that's super clear, that's mm -hmm. resonating. Um, the webs an abs average website will will do like three thousand percent ROI. Like it's insane when you professionally build it with somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, yeah, somebody would talk to me one time. Somebody asked me to do a website for five hundred dollars, and I was like, <laughs> "What?" Um, so yeah, I think I, I totally get not having a lot of money. I totally get it. But when you do have money, I think it's one of the smartest investments that you can make is your personal brand and your Absolutely. website. Yeah. 100%. And that is so funny that you said that $500. I can relate. Oh. <laughs> you no, know, overqualified I am like. Yeah. Yeah. And, and <laughs> folks listening, we're not. You know, I'm, I'm sure I can speak for myself. I'm sure Ari feels the same way. We're not trying to boast or toot our own horns here, but what, what we do, this industry is very valuable and very important for a business owner. I yeah. say one part of, you know, I just spoke at an event in September and, and, and the subject is coming from a performance background is that every, uh, just like every performer needs a spotlight, yeah. every business owner needs for me, it was a funnel for you. It's a website, a, a, a brand, right? So it's, it's so important. And like she said, it is the biggest, best investment that you can make for your business. So, yeah. uh, yeah, you are, you're, you want to add to that? Oh, go ahead. Yes. I think, you know, in 2024, we're such a visual culture and we're always online and nobody's making big purchases on TikTok and on Instagram, on, you know, they're driving traffic to your website. And so 
if most of your business is through word of mouth, right, eventually that dries up. You have to convert people that don't know you, like you, or trust you yet. How do you do that? You have to do a website that is fully you and stands in for you when you're not there. And I think that so many people underestimate the power of, of, hey, a website, I really need to, I need to work with her because she spoke directly to me. She understands my problem. Um, I think so many people take for granted how much their personal brand can really attract premium paying clients truly and honestly to you. Yep, absolutely. And for anyone listening, I'd like to just really quickly um, explain, and, and Ari, I'll, I'll let you chime yeah. in on this too, but some people might be wondering, well, you're talking about funnels, landing pages, and websites. What's the difference? Because a lot of people in my work get yeah. confused between a funnel and a website. So I want to explain that real quick and, and tell you for anyone listening what the difference is. A website, like Ari said, is your main kind of like your showcase, your, um, what's a, a better word? Home. I always say it's your digital business home. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And it, it showcases everything that you do, all, all, all of the different things and options. Whereas a funnel is for one specific offer that you, that you're offering, either it be a, a course or service or coaching, whatever it might be. A funnel is something that just guides the customer through the journey of purchasing that one item and one item only. There's only one call to action on any funnel. Whereas a website has multiple, uh, things for you to visit regarding the business and all about the business and, and different things that they might be doing or offering. So is that, did I explain that correctly? Yeah. Ari? Okay, good. Yes. yes. The funnel supports the website. It's yep. a really great way. I always say that the website is your digital storefront and email marketing newsletters, funnels are amazing supportive tools for your website um, and I always think of them as like roads leading to the website, right? And they they spoke out, they spoke in, and they're all going to the center of the wheel. And the the website must be the center. And then you can invest in social media, you can in invest in SEO, you can invest in funnels, you can invest in landing pages. All of these things go around the center, which is you and your brand and your website. So funnels are amazing because they're so laser focused targeted mm. when done correctly. Yeah, exactly. And in the funnel where we call it the website, we call it the funnel hub. It's like, yeah, you know, we're the, the hub. hub. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So, oh, I like that. I'm going to use that because I always say digital home and I always say before you invite guests, make sure your home is clean. And I notice that so many people will be like posting every day, doing the newsletters. And then I'm like, but I went to your website and it's like driving traffic to a terrible website. You're doing all this work and it's, it's actually working against working you. Working against you, yeah. It's, it's literally, you're wasting your time. Your home, your, your digital storefront, right? Like, let's say you went and rented out a space. If you don't clean it for two years and you just leave it, it's going to get dirty and it's not going to resonate and it's messy and dusty. Your your digital home has to be so put together before you start sending the invites. I love, I love the hub thing. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. cool. Yeah. Cause, cause I look at it from the outside in, meaning that, yes. um, you know, your website yeah. has roads to all the funnels, right? Yeah. Whereas you're, you're thinking it, the roads to the website, which is kind of cool that we see it from the opposite. We which... see it from opposite perspective, but we're so compatible and we we're so, aligned and helping the customer or our customer, our client get success. Right. And, yeah. um, we do it slightly different, but I think both are so valuable for a business's success. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So tell me, do you have anything exciting coming up? Any other, uh, podcasts or any speaking things coming up that we want to know about? Um, I just came from a speaking engagement. Um, I have, a really exciting magazine article coming out called Face oh. of Austin. I'm really excited about that. Um, so they do all the best businesses in Austin and I got web design. So I'm really excited. Oh my God, that's so exciting. So when does that yeah. come out? I think it comes out in December. So right now they're having me 
look at all the photos that I want to be included. Um, so I'm really excited about that because I grew up really shy. So I'm like stepping out my comfort zone and like getting photos taken is like still a little nerve wracking. But um, what else do I have? I do a lot of women's workshops online. And honestly, they're not new for me, but I just really enjoy them. And awesome. I think I want to start um, two things. I want to start my own networking group, networking group called Badass Women entrepreneurs. So I'm currently interviewing that for the new year. And I want to start a, a women's book club um, for like business books, but like not so heavy, right? Like let's have fun. Let's have a glass of wine. Um, yeah. So not really speaking and work related, but I think I just want more groups of women that are like growth oriented, who are willing to refer you, you know, so many women or so many business owners will kind of forget that referrals matter, right? And so I really want to get with women who are willing to, hey, you should go work with Ari or mm -hmm. put your name in good spaces. Um, but I also think we can learn so much from each other. So I'm just trying to create more of a woman community around yeah. me because as the digital nomad Obviously, I don't speak Spanish fluently. I'm really missing networking groups in person. It's very hard to find. So I'm really excited to kind of create my own on around me. So that's yeah. that's great. Definitely keep me posted on that because I'd be interested. Oh, I'll invite you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You after interview. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. That's so kind. So You're tell so me, where are, you, where are you going next after Columbia? Oh, I want to go home um, for Albuquerque, um, to see my parents and, and, you know, friends back home. Um, so I'll spend a month there. It's really cold. So I just want to cozy up. Um, but I don't know, 2025, I really want to like sit. I always do a silence retreat before the new year. So I take a, a few days, I put my phone in a box, rent a little cottage and I just journal and meditate and sit in silence and just relax, take a nap. And then I think I get really clear on the next year. So usually a ping will come from the universe. Oh, go here or something. So I'm honestly just waiting for the ping. Um, so I don't know. We'll see. I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Oh yeah. my goodness. This has been so great. We're getting to be out of time here, but th this sure. has been such a great talk. And I, I don't know if you've seen any of my other episodes, but at the end of every episode, I... Uh, just ask some random questions just so that we can get to know you better. Okay. 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 And they're always the same questions. So it's not like I'm making up different questions. Um, right. If given the opportunity to go to space and walk on the moon, would you? Absolutely. A hundred percent. Not even a hesitation. That is so funny. I would not. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like I am pretty adventurous. Yeah. So I'd do it. Okay. Awesome. All right. If you had the opportunity to have dinner uh -huh. with any one person alive or dead, who oh. would you choose? You know, this is my dating question. <laughs> oh my what? God. Really? That's funny. <laughs> okay. I have, uh, I would meet with Gandhi and Jesus because I think they would be best friends. Um, are they really dead? I don't know. But <laughs> I think me being a religious studies and psychology major, I saw so much overlap. I grew up really Catholic and I went through my own spiritual crisis because I was like, I see all the perspectives now. I would love to talk to Jesus and Gandhi. I think they would be so fascinating to just listen to them. Um, so that would be yeah. my dead and then for a live, I'm really obsessed with Jay Shetty. He's the former monk. And I know he can be a little bit controversial, but I love his meditations, his books. He has an app that you do workshops on different themes for the month. And I think he's, I think it's really fascinating to see a man like live with integrity and values in 2024. And that's what he became famous for. And then there's this woman I love called Mimi Icon. She's like kind of an influencer, but kind of not. And she just lives with her values first. And 
I really respect her. So I would like to see how they get along. And I would like to ask them questions. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard of Jay Shetty. In fact, um, I was just, when you were, I was trying to think of who it was. Somebody I had on my podcast recently mm -hmm. mentioned him. I'll have yeah. to go back and check, but that's funny that he came up twice in like the last couple of weeks. Um, and mm -hmm. my answer, by the way, is also Jesus. So. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Maybe we can all go to dinner sometime. <laughs> I'll send out the invoice. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I mean, That's awesome. Who, yeah. who better to talk to? Like, I would like to ask all the questions. Right? Exactly. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. Okay. And then the last one is just kind of for my gain, because I'm creating my reading list. What one book has most inspired you, whether it be professional or, or fictional? Ooh, I love this question. I'm obsessed with reading. Okay. I, I would say... The book that's made the biggest impact is called The Way of Integrity by Martha Beck. She is fascinating. She basically talks about how integrity is not a moral good or bad. It's about wholeness. And she relates it to a plane. So when a plane is out of integrity and not in alignment, it can't go from point A to point B. And so when you're feeling stressed or overwhelmed or anxious, that's your body working absolutely correctly, just like a plane would like signal lights, fix me, fix me, mm. saying you are not in alignment. And so it's basically saying your body is this beautiful teacher to get you back to wholeness. And the way you do that is through not lying at all. You can't lie to other people and you can't lie to, to yourself. And she relates the whole book through Dante's Inferno so she says, basically, when you're in that place of anxiety, stress, overwhelm, you're in your own type of hell, a metaphorical hell. Mm -hmm. and you get to being really truthful of who you are, your wholeness, and truly living in alignment with your deepest self. You're in your own metaphorical heaven. And so she she does all these amazing questions and journal prompts. And I've, I think I've read it like four times in the last year or two. Um, I Who is the author? Her name is Martha Beck. Martha Beck. Okay. All right. I'm going to look that one up. What, what's That's, your book? Um, uh, Right now, I'm actually reading it right now. It's life changing. Not. Uh, yeah. Not that book. No, my, my oh, okay. favorite book uh, is uh, Worthy, Jamie Kern Lima. It's on my book list. Okay. I'll have to move it up. Yeah. I, I, it's, I mean, there's been a lot of books that I've found uh, of course all the Russell Brunson books the um traffic secrets and all those I love those not like to inspire but mostly to, yeah. to learn because I'm a, a constant learner I just learn I love to learn yeah but but this book uh worthy is just so amazing and, and it's just so empowering so yes definitely push it up on that list okay it's been on my list for a while so I'm gonna I'm gonna move it up I love reading books by women, especially because yeah. I think that's what I'm kind of craving. So I'm going to look yeah. that up. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. So if people want to get in touch with you, Ari, how would they do that? LinkedIn, Ariana Carmen Rose, um, or my website, Ari Rose Designs is the best one. Okay. And of course, I'll have all of that information in the show notes. So if people want to contact you, they will have the link to do so. So Ari, this has been so fantastic. I thank you for joining me today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. I honestly had fun. My cheeks hurt from smiling. <laughs> <laughs> I love thank that. You. All right, everybody, make sure to tune in next time on the Born or Made podcast.